This video is sponsored by Squarespace. When you think of national parks, you'll probably think of vast wilderness areas with spectacular natural beauty, far from the hustle and bustle of the city. Places like Yellowstone, Yosemite, and the Grand Canyon are probably what come to mind. But not all national parks are like that. Some sit within or just outside the suburbs of major cities. Some are even located in downtowns, surrounded not by mountains or open sky, but by skyscrapers and highways. I've been staying in Chicago for the last week, filming a number of videos, and I took a day trip to Indiana Dunes National Park, which borders the city's suburbs in northwestern Indiana and is accessible by the city's commuter rail lines. Downtown Chicago is even visible on a nice day from the park. It struck me just how integrated the park was into one of the largest urban areas in the country. I was able to take a fairly quick train ride right from downtown, spend time hiking and relaxing in a national park, and make it back with several more hours of daylight left to explore the city. Having a national park in your backyard is a great amenity for people living in these cities to enjoy, allowing them to connect with and enjoy nature without having to travel too far from home or spend a lot of money on a long vacation. And Indiana Dunes isn't the only national park in the US like this. There are quite a few that are located in or just outside of urban areas, allowing beautiful natural areas near the city to be both protected from urban encroachment and enjoyed by the large populations that live nearby. These parks are typically not too well known by people outside of the surrounding area, but their proximity to the city often makes them some of the country's most visited parks. In this video, I'll be taking a brief look at the eight national parks in the United States that I think can best be described as urban parks. Hello and welcome to That Is Interesting. I'm your host Carter. Today, America's urban national parks and the cities they're connected to. If you're trying to start a blog, newsletter, or an online business, having a nice professional looking website will give you a lot of credibility. Today's sponsor, Squarespace, makes creating your own website easy and simple. Recently, I've been working on building my own website to complement this channel, and Squarespace has been super user friendly and honestly a really fun experience. In this day and age, having your own website can be really useful. Anything from starting your own small business, looking to raise money for a cause that's important to you, or documenting your travels will be made so much easier with a website, and with Squarespace, you can build your own website with your own domain that looks personalized and professional. Do you want to teach an online course? Their member areas feature allows you to earn extra income doing just that. Want to send emails directly to your customers, start your own blog, collect donations? All that and more is easily doable with Squarespace, and you can link it to your other social media sites as well as use their great analytics tools to see just how much traffic your site is getting. The best part is, I've got a special deal on Squarespace just for you. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash thatisinteresting to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain using code thatisinteresting. Before we get started, I'll briefly go over my methodology. There are 63 national parks in the United States, and the National Park Service itself manages a total of 424 sites, Everything from national monuments to seashores, preserves, battlefields, and historic sites. Some people will call anything managed by the National Park Service a national park, but in this video I'll just be looking at these 63 units that are called national parks. This means that places like San Francisco's beautiful Golden Gate National Recreation Area won't make the cut. Additionally, the park has to be either within or directly bordering the urban area of a major city. There's one exception on this list that's in a smaller city, but the park itself includes a lot of the city's downtown buildings, so I'm making an exception. This means that national parks that are just a few hours outside the city and probably doable as a day trip won't be included if they don't border the suburbs of the city itself. Because of that, here are a few honorable mentions that are close and accessible from the city, but that I'm not including as urban parks. There's Rocky Mountain National Park, not far from Denver. Olympic and Mount Rainier, which are pretty close to the Seattle-Tacoma area. El Paso, Texas is just a few hours from three different national parks. Guadalupe Mountains, as well as Carlsbad Caverns in White Sands in New Mexico. Joshua Tree in the Channel Islands aren't too far from Los Angeles, and Las Vegas is actually pretty close as the crow flies from the Grand Canyon, but it's a much longer drive to actually get there. The routes aren't too direct because Lake Mead is in the way, as well as a number of mountain ranges and canyons. With that said, let's get going. First on the list is Indiana Dunes National Park. One of the newest national parks in the country, Indiana Dunes became a park in 2019. 
It's located in Porter County, Indiana, at the southern tip of Lake Michigan. It's split into an eastern and western section, divided by Burns Harbor, a massive center of steel mills combined with an international port. The park is long, stretching along most of Indiana's lakeshore, but not stretching very deep into the state. On its eastern end is the town of Michigan City, Indiana. The forest-covered dunes and sandy beaches border some rural agricultural areas outside of Michigan City, but it isn't too far until it reaches the suburban fringes of Chicago, the country's third most populous urban area. Towns like Porter, Chesterton, Portage, and Gary make up the southeasternmost edge of the greater Chicagoland urban area. But this isn't typical suburbia. Much of the northwestern Indiana suburbs are heavily industrialized. Their location around the southern tip of Lake Michigan, providing a strategic location for shipments of both coal from the south and iron from the north, allowing the area to develop into a huge steel manufacturing center, which has since suffered severe economic decline. Suburban Chicago, though, has continued to spread across state lines. Long a popular recreation area for Chicagoans, the dunes have been subject to compromise throughout the decades over whether they should be preserved or used for manufacturing and industry. Prior to the establishment of the National Park, parts were set aside as a national lakeshore and a state park, while other sections of the dunes were developed into industrial areas such as ports, steel mills, and oil refineries, which can still be seen from the park today, creating an interesting juxtaposition. Today, it's less than an hour's drive from downtown Chicago to the western section of the National Park, and Indiana cities like Gary are only 10 minutes away. You can also access the park using public transit with the South Shore Line, a commuter rail from Chicago to South Bend, Indiana, stopping at the eastern section of the park. Next on the list, the fourth largest urban area in the country is directly next to not one, but two national parks, the Everglades and Biscayne. Miami's city limits are fairly small, but it's the core of a massive urban area home to 6 million people, surpassed in the U.S. only by New York City, Los Angeles, and Chicago. The Florida city is a massive urban experiment and saw most of its growth only in the last century, helped by a railroad line and a number of land booms, part of the Sun Belt, a string of cities and states which saw massive population growth as Americans moved to warmer climates with the advent of air conditioning and increased economic stability after World War II. Its geography is also quite unusual. While most cities see their urban areas sprawl out in a more circular expanse from their downtowns, Greater Miami is long and thin, rarely wider than 20 miles, but stretching 110 miles in length, from Florida City in the south to Jupiter in the north, part of an Atlantic coast that's urbanized for most of the state. Its unusual geography is because the city is sandwiched between and built on two major natural obstacles. To its east lies the Atlantic Ocean, and to its west, the Everglades, an enormous and spectacular wetland system that makes up most of South Florida. This is the marshland that Miami was built on, the reason it and its suburbs are filled with lakes and canals, and why you always hear stories about gators wandering into residential neighborhoods. Unlike most cities whose suburbs gradually taper off, leaving heavily populated rural and exurban areas surrounding them, the proximity of the Everglades to the city makes that nearly impossible. In South Florida, suburban areas often have a clear cutoff. Residential neighborhoods ending suddenly, the next population centers you'll encounter to the west, often on the state's other coast, on the Gulf of Mexico, miles and miles of wilderness in between. The Everglades are a very important ecosystem. Water from Lake Okeechobee, the 10th largest lake in the US, spills out and slowly flows through the glades into Florida Bay. Mangrove and cypress swamps, alligators, manatees, and sea turtles thrive in the park. But as agricultural interests and flood control projects have diverted its water and developed its lands, and as cities like Miami as well as sprawling communities on the Gulf Coast like Naples, Fort Myers, and Cape Coral have expanded, they've lost half their land to development, making the protection of part of them as a national park in 1947 very important. On the other side of Miami, between the city and the barrier islands which sit to its south and east, lies Biscayne Bay. Most of the bay, as well as a number of keys and barrier islands and some coastal parts of the mainland, are protected as Biscayne National Park. As the crow flies, it's only six miles from downtown Miami. It's mostly a marine park, home to coral reefs, mangrove forests, shipwrecks and islands, and incredible sea life. It's hard to believe that just a few miles away in the same bay sits a busy port and a huge city with one of the largest skylines in the country. The main entrance to the Everglades is about an hour from downtown Miami, and while Biscayne is very close if you have access to a boat, the main boat launches are anywhere from a half hour to an hour from downtown, making both parks pretty easily accessible from the city. 
Next on the list is a park that you don't often hear too much about. You might know Cleveland's Cuyahoga River for the multiple times that it famously caught on fire, but much of the once heavily polluted river is now set aside as Ohio's Cuyahoga Valley National Park, surrounded to its north, east, and west by the Cleveland suburbs, and whose northern end is less than three miles south of Cleveland's city limits. The long, thin park follows the Cuyahoga between two cities, with the suburbs of Akron reaching its southern tip. It's almost completely surrounded by urban areas. Downtown Cleveland is 8 miles away in one end, downtown Akron 6 miles from the other end. The Cuyahoga River was an important part of Ohio's development into an industrial power. Construction of the Ohio and Erie Canal allowed shipping between Lake Erie and the Ohio River through the Cuyahoga and Scioto Rivers. Its construction helped Cleveland and Akron grow significantly, and areas along the Cuyahoga and Cleveland soon became home to ports, rail yards, steel mills, and Standard Oil's first refinery. Today, it still remains heavily industrial. The incredibly polluted river caught fire dozens of times, but it was a fire in 1969 that led to national outrage, helping spark the environmental movement. In the next few years, the U.S. created the Environmental Protection Agency and passed the Clean Air and Clean Water Acts. Meanwhile, people from Cleveland and Akron had been using the forested valley between the two cities to enjoy nature and get away from the city for decades. Worried about the health of the river and the preservation of their local pocket of nature, especially as the suburbs of Cleveland and Akron expanded further into the valley, locals pushed for the preservation of the valley. And it was protected as a national recreation area. In 2000, it was named a national park. You may have never heard of Cuyahoga Valley, but it's widely used by people in the heavily urbanized northeast part of Ohio. Just 16 minutes from Akron and 19 minutes from Cleveland, nearly 3 million people visit Cuyahoga Valley each year, nearly as many as Yellowstone and Yosemite, making it the ninth most visited national park in the country. While most of the other parks in this list are natural areas right outside the city, the next park is one where in many areas, the city and the national park are one and the same. Hot Springs National Park in Hot Springs, Arkansas is in my opinion one of the most interesting places in the country, especially when considering the relatively minimal attention it gets. Hot Springs is far smaller than any other city I'm including on this list, only home to around 60,000 people in its urban area. But the degree to which the park is integrated with the city, I think warrants its designation as an urban national park. The city, located in Arkansas's Washita Mountains, is in a beautiful natural setting. While most of the city itself sprawls out across a flatter valley, its downtown is pressed against the mountains, and its main street, nicknamed Bathhouse Row, cuts through a canyon in the mountains before the city spills out, climbing the lower hills on the other side. This means much of downtown Hot Springs is one street wide, ornate bathhouses surrounded by forested mountains on either side. The natural springs that push hot water to the surface throughout the city made it a popular resort town in the early 1800s, and as money poured into the city, it built beautiful bathhouse resorts and is filled with taller buildings than you'd imagine for a city of its size. Designated a national park in 1921, Hot Springs was originally protected in 1832, the first time the federal government ever set aside land for conservation. A precursor to the National Park Service, the city of Hot Springs wouldn't even be incorporated for another 19 years. The small park contains not just the mountains outside the city, but many of the buildings of Bathhouse Row itself. The fact that the National Park extends right up to Hot Springs downtown places excellent trails up the mountains and through the town, right among its main streets and taller buildings. Beautiful natural areas and an ornate city center with beautiful architecture, themed bathhouses, city fountains with hot water bubbling up, and a viewing tower in the mountains make Hot Springs one of America's most beautiful cities, a fascinating combination of city and national park. Next on the list is another one of the country's newest national parks, set aside in just 2018. While every other national park in the country is entirely or at least partially a natural area, the Gateway Arch is unique in that it is pretty much just a city park. One that, though, is home to one of the most iconic structures in the world and is of strong historical significance. It's the smallest national park in the country by far, 28 times smaller than the second smallest park, Hot Springs. The park, of course, sits in downtown St. Louis, Missouri, nestled between the Mississippi River and the skyscrapers downtown. It's also home to the city's old courthouse, where the infamous Dred Scott v. Sanford decision was heard before it reached the Supreme Court. The park was built in the 1940s as a memorial to Thomas Jefferson, 
the Louisiana Purchase, and American Westward Expansion, particularly the Lewis and Clark Expedition, which set off west from near St. Louis. Construction of the park was initially controversial. It saw much of downtown St. Louis cleared away for construction. Finnish architect Aro Saarinen won a competition for its design, which he centered around the Gateway Arch, often called the St. Louis Arch, not built until the 1960s. At 630 feet, it's taller than any other structure in the state. You can go to the top of the arch using a tram inside, and it's home to an observation deck. It's an iconic landmark in the city, it's hard to imagine St. Louis without it, and though not a major area for natural recreation like other national parks, it still gives the over 2 million people who live in Greater St. Louis access to a national park right in their city. Tucson, Arizona's second largest urban area, sits in the desert. Surrounded by mountains, the outskirts of the city stretching up into the foothills. To both the city's east and west, the mountains are protected as Saguaro National Park, another park split into an eastern and western half. The Rincon Mountain District in the east and the Tucson Mountain District in the west. The Rincon Mountains are one of Arizona's sky islands, which you might remember from one of my out of place geography episodes, but the park is most famous for the giant saguaro cacti which grow throughout it, the iconic cactus species that most of us associate the plant with. The mountains in the park are certainly beautiful, but it's the cacti it was set aside to protect. Saguaro cacti grow throughout much of the Sonoran Desert, so they can be found throughout southern Arizona as well as the Mexican state of Sonora. The proximity to Tucson, though, made it a particularly appealing location for a park dedicated to the cactus, as city residents could easily visit it. On top of that, scientists from the University of Arizona, located in Tucson, as well as political figures from the city, pushed for it to be located nearby. Today, the eastern and western entrances to the park are only about a 30-minute drive from downtown Tucson in opposite directions, allowing easy access to the park from the city. Now, for the last national park in the United States that I consider to abut the urban area of a large city, we have Congaree National Park, just outside of South Carolina's capital city, Columbia. The state's second largest urban area after Charleston, Greater Columbia is home to nearly 600,000 people and sits on the Congaree River in the center of the state. Sitting on the river's fall line, mills in the falls, as well as a canal that bypassed them, helped the city grow as well as its designation as state capital. Along the river, just southeast of the city, sits an enormous forest growing in the river's floodplain. An old growth, bottomland hardwood forest, it's the largest on the continent, and is home to the tallest trees in 15 different species, all in all among the tallest forests in the eastern part of the country. Threatened by logging, local conservationists and business leaders pushed to protect the forest, which was named a national monument in 1976. In 2003, Congaree became a national park. Despite being a 27 minute drive from downtown Columbia, the beautiful forest is one of the least visited of the country's parks, relatively unknown outside the region. Those are the eight national parks in the US that I think can rightly be described as urban national parks. Indiana Dunes, Everglades, Biscayne, Cuyahoga Valley, Hot Springs, Gateway Arch, Saguaro, and Congaree. Which of these parks would you most like to visit? Are there any national parks that I didn't include that you think could be considered urban national parks? If you live outside of the US, are there similar examples in your home country? Leave a comment below and let me know. On top of that, if you enjoyed this video, I think you're really going to love a new series I'll be releasing soon. It's called The National Parks Explored, and in it I'll be making a short video on each of the country's national parks. You can learn about their history, geography, and the spectacular sites, as well as plant and animal life that you can find if you visit. I want to give a big thank you to everyone who's already joined my Patreon. Through it you can access different things such as behind the scenes videos, early access to maps I create, an exclusive Discord Q&A with me, ad free content, and shoutouts to my videos. Please be sure to check out the TII store, where you'll be able to purchase all sorts of official that is interesting products and merchandise, including shirts, hoodies, beanies, masks, mugs, backpacks, laptop stickers and sleeves, and so on. I really appreciate the over 900 of you who have already joined my Discord server. If you haven't joined the Discord server yet, it's a great place to continue conversations about the topics discussed in these videos, interact with fellow viewers, and help provide information and suggestions for future videos. It's a great community, and we do fun stuff like geography game nights, live podcasts, and so on. I'll put links to both the Patreon and the Discord in the comments. Thank you for watching this video, and I hope you learned something new. Subscribe for more content like this. I cover the countries, cities, people, and places of the world and beyond. These videos will leave you saying, that is interesting.